across the UK on DAB, online and on your smart speaker. This is Times Radio. Early breakfast with Callum MacDonald. It's 20 past five. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, and let's continue our look at this morning's headlines. We've got Georgia Leatherdale Gilholy with us, a Young Voices UK contributor and external communications officer with the British Conservation Alliance. Georgia, good morning. Welcome to the programme. Thank you, Callum. It's good to be here. Uh, let's start then with some of the politics um, following the, the weekend of, of vigils and demonstrations um, this weekend that we've uh, kind of touched on already this morning. So uh, to start with, Boris Johnson being deeply concerned um, by the, the actions of the police at the vigil for Sarah Everard on, on Saturday night. And I just wonder, you know, just to pick up on, on what we've heard from Ollie and from Charlotte already this morning, um, I just wonder how, how satisfied you are with the political interventions on this so far? Has the, has the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, have they, have they done enough? Are they doing enough? So the fact that there is going to be an independent investigation is is certainly promising to me. I think that, you know, everyone saw the horrific scenes on Saturday night on social media. Those kind of things, they can't, you know, go amiss. There needs to be investigation because trust in the police is ultimately what allows the police to operate and function, especially in, you know, a busy hectic city like London where there are a lot of crime issues, uh, especially with, you know, what is what happened unfortunately to Sarah. Um, we really need to be to be making sure that the police are held accountable and so are, you know, protests and those kind of things allowed to happen mm. because the, you know this is a free society we can't we can't see these things uh you know increasingly on a monthly daily basis and then not be you know a critical lens thrown onto that yeah indeed and i suppose you know just to pick up on one of the comments that charlotte made which was kind of having these independent reviews um announced is is politically is, you know is, is, will be seen as essential by many but politically is quite convenient because it kind of removes the the focus from the politicians and onto whatever the outcome of, of these independent reviews into what happened at the weekend will be um i suppose you know one sort of more uh, crude interpretation of that is that it's kind of passing the buck a little and it's kind of abdicating responsibility on, on the side of the politicians. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, we live in a democracy. Uh, legis the legislature and, of course, the executive with ministers, etc., have a lot to do with how the police operates. But I also think, you know, it is up to invest uh, independent rather bodies mm. to investigate these matters rather than you know, people posturing in Parliament or activist groups, for example. And there's been lots of talk as well in the in the aftermath of the weekend about the, the new uh, crime bill, the policing bill that's making its way through Parliament in the next couple of days. And Charlotte outlining that is going to pass. But it's interesting to kind of to, to just sort of look at the, the, the political ins and outs of this as well. You know, the Labour Party choosing now to oppose it. Um, and, and concerns remain about the sorts of powers that it's going to hand to, for example, the Home Secretary in terms of defining what is um, you know a peaceful process or, or a disruptive process, and and that being quite an arbitrary measure, actually. How concerned are you about this bill? I'm very concerned, Callum. I think everyone has seen the more extreme violent protests happen in the UK and across the world over the past year. Um, some of the Extinction Rebellion, you know, protests, especially if you're living in central London, you know, um, you know, they shut down things, that kind of thing. There were some violent elements, but the problem is that I don't think this kind of legislation is the way the way to deal with those problems. We need to have a transparent debate and allowing the Home Secretary or a senior police officer to determine what's serious enough to to uh, mandate a protest and what kind of disruption is acceptable is, I believe, you know, it's not the right move to make. Non-violent protest is the foundation of constitutional freedoms in the United Kingdom. This is not the way to deal with these issues at all. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, part of this um, bill is, is outlined by Ian Dunn from politics.co.uk. He says the function of the section on, uh, on, on, um, on protesting, on the policing of protesting, is simple, he says. It aims to silence them. It is cancel culture on a statutory footing directed against the left. Now, that's his read of it. Is, is that something you agree with as well, then? Um, I think cancel culture is a big term that's often sort of stung around now because it's, it's quite sort of a popular mm. buzzword, right? Mm. I think that having, you know, looked at the wording of the, of the bill proposal, I don't necessarily think that it's an aim to discriminate against the left in particular, but maybe, you know, just radical elements in general. So whether that be on the right, the left, or sort of cross boundaries, I think that actually, you know, protest against this 
possible restrictions on protest is something that could maybe bring people on the right and the left together who don't necessarily agree with uh, these limits that are being placed on us. Wow, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, maybe there's unity in there, <laughs> in there somewhere. Goodness me, what a revolution that would be. Uh, right, should we have a little look at some of the other stories that are uh, doing the rounds as well this morning? It's worth saying that on the front pages are pictures of the, the vigils and the demonstration last night um, as well and the, the signs that are being held up by the, uh, I mean, it's difficult to say, hundreds of women, definitely, potentially thousands in the Parliament Square pictures from, from last night as well. So uh, lots of focus on that on the front pages this morning. Um, another one that's, that's caught my eye, and this is from uh, The Times this morning, uh, the National, uh, the, excuse me, the, um, Sir Ian uh, Diamond, the ONS chief from the Office for National Statistics, says a third wave of COVID in autumn is inevitable, despite strong early evidence of vaccine protection. Um, he is warning that it's a third wave is on its way, uh, despite confidence in the vaccine rollout. And I just wonder what this, what this does to us, basically, Georgia, this morning to kind of read this headline. It's quite demoralising at some mm -hmm. level, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite ironic because on the Andrew Marsh show yesterday, Diamond did say that we do need to recognise that the virus isn't going away. But at the same time, you know, that means that we need to be sort of mitigating the damage while trying to open up society. We need to get to a point where most people are vaccinated, most vulnerable and elderly people are vaccinated and then we need to get back to you know the normal way of life in the safest way possible i don't think it's appropriate to be talking about lockdown measures in autumn and winter if the vaccine rollout goes goes well as it is i i just heard you talking about mm. how our efforts are being ramped up i don't think it's appropriate for our faith in the economy and in society I just wonder what a third a third wave then means. You know, are we at the point where we can, by the autumn, for example, are we at the point where we can kind of cope with it, where, where vaccines are on course to be, uh, you know, dished out by then? Um, or as you say, are we going to going to have to be bounced into some sort of next next level of restrictions? We're all we've all got our eyes on June the twenty first, don't we, and freedom? But actually, is there a risk that by the autumn we could all be facing tighter restrictions once again? Mm -hmm, absolutely. I've got to the point um, in reading the news where I don't necessarily put my faith in certain dates and certain things opening at certain times because we've seen the government make so many U-turns, you know, even even uh, within 24 hours or within sort of five, six hours before the next day on uh, in terms of travel and schools, that kind of thing. So I think that, yeah, unfortunately, whatever our opinions are on the situation, we do need to pre be prepared for another lockdown. It's definitely a possibility. Georgia, thank you so much. Really lovely to have you on the programme. We'll catch you again soon. That's Georgia Leatherdale Gilholy, Young Voices UK contributor and external communications officer with the British Conservation Alliance, uh, columnist and writer, among other things. Nice to have Georgia on the programme this morning.